Father, we confess before you that um, reading your word can become a chore. And although we desire it, but we might be far away from uh, developing the taste for it. And there's so many uh, delicious things out there, God. Um, there's no shortage of uh, the way to entertain ourselves and just kick back and relax. Uh, and, and these things are all good, but just like we need sustenance and we cannot avoid not eat, we cannot avoid eating, we must eat your word and grow as a result of it. Any other thought is human pride and hubris to think that we can go on for a, a prolonged period of not reading and meditating upon your word. So God, I pray that you will be with us, especially um, a new joining brother who shared with us uh, what, what this means to him. So God, I pray that you will um, quench our thirst and satisfy our hunger as we come before your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okie dokie. Uh, I share with you, um, I, I said I would share with you the sort of what, what is the purpose of uh, Live Life Devo. You know, it, it seems like part of it is uh, like a devotional and part of it is a Bible study and it's sort of both. But if I may, there, there are three um, main goals that I'm trying to achieve. One is, if you can imagine a cattle grazing, we're, we're learning to graze and we are learning to go out there and, and locate food and, and graze it. But another thing that a cattle does um, or a bull or yeah, it, it does is that it finds a quiet place, a quiet moment in the day where it um, lies down or leans or stands, whatever it does, and it ruminates. And the word ruminate is a useful word because um, one, it means that you're regurgitating, the cow is regurgitating what it grazed and it rechews so that it becomes digestible and that it gets its nutrients out of it and repeats this process until the food is actually absorbed. And that's what we ought to do with the sermon, with our daily reading. After you graze it, you need to find a, a quiet moment to ruminate upon it. And like I said, the word rumination is a um, useful word for us because not only is it regurgitating for a cow, but also it means to think over, to meditate and think deeply and ponder upon something so that it becomes yours and is digested. So what do we do with uh, the word of God that we graze and we have digested? Is it just for ourselves? Of course, it, it feeds the person uh, who have grazed and digested the word of God. But also that's what propels a, a cattle or cow or uh, to, uh, to serve, to live, to live and serve. So whatever word of God you gain, whatever you digested, it becomes your way of serving other people. And um, there are so many ways to serve and I, I won't get into that, but the primary way that I want to emphasize here is that you serve uh, through sharing what you have grazed and ruminated. That it is sweet and delectable and, and you're able to articulate the taste of grass. When you hear a sermon on Sunday, uh, it, it's kind of like, oh, okay, I heard it. Um, I, you know, it's, it's good, I understood it or, you know, I don't know, I didn't get it, whatever the case might be. But if you have ruminated upon it, if you have regurgitated and meditated, then you can describe the taste and you can give that to somebody. And, and that's what I'm looking for. Okay, and that's why we're here. Grace, 
to graze and to ruminate and to share what we have tasted and what God has given to us. All right. So tonight, uh, I'm going to kind of teach us how to graze and um, how to get meaning out of the text. And I'm going to share that with you. Oh, did I cut and paste it, the link? Okay. Obviously, I'm super organized today. Hmm. Please go to your chat, and I have provided a link for you. You can go there, or I can also share the screen with you. And this is our sermon text. Okay. So I'm going to give you five minutes to read that. And um, we're going to simply, um, I don't know uh, what the best way to put it. Uh, we're going to read it. And for sake of saving time. Hmm. No, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to do it this way. I actually had another live Devo prepared. What I'm going to do is... Yeah, so don't use the link that I provided for you. Um, I'm going to have you uh, very quickly graze through um, these nine chapters by reading these big headings, okay? And um, how we're going to do it tonight is I'm going to give you a little intro of chapter nine. Uh, and, and it might be confusing for some of you if you weren't there on Sunday. But basically, uh, when David has become a full king over Judah and Israel, so he's a king over all the nations of Israel, and all, he, all the enemies have been put away and they have subsided. Uh, he is now looking to bestow his favor upon uh, anyone that belongs to the house of Saul. And, and King Saul is someone who is the first king of Israel and he tried to kill David numerous times. And um, despite of that, and despite the fact that if he spares somebody from house of Saul, that they can assassinate him is saving um, anyone who is from house of Saul. And in this case, there's one left and his name is Mephibosheth. Okay. So the question is this. So we're, learned, we're gonna learn how to grace very quickly. The question is why doesn't David save Mephibosheth earlier on? Okay, that's the question. I wanna take this. Why doesn't David save M earlier, uh, earlier? Okay, so why a chapter nine? Why not a chapter one, two, or three, or four? So in order to answer that question, we're going to look through uh, these chapters very quickly uh, and, and, and see why David didn't save Mephibosheth until chapter nine. All right, so I'm gonna give you five minutes.
Maybe just a couple more minutes. All right, all right. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> that's big. Okay, some of you have commented already um, because country is still divided. So the question is, uh, why, why didn't David save uh, Mephibosheth earlier, uh, earlier on, I guess, or sooner? And the response to that is because the country is still divided and he does not yet have the authority. So there's division in the land. So it's country is unsettled. Um, and if that's kind of confusing for you, you just have to know that Israel is not um, one cohesive country. They, there's a predominant power of Judah, of one tribe, but has lots of power, lots of authority. If you compare it kind of to a uh, state, it would be like, I don't know, Texas and, and the U.S., I guess. And Texans kind of see themselves as a unique part of the whole compared to the whole. So there's authority issue there and division. And David had gratitude towards God in the previous chapter. So that's chapter eight, which then compelled him to show kindness to uh, Mephibosheth. And that's really interesting that um, it's his religious experience, if you will that allowed him to give more to his neighbors. And that, that's a very uh, dead on in terms of theology, that more you experience God, more loving person and a gracious and merciful person you will be. Okay, and then in a similar vein, uh, as, as to the first comment, the country was uh, in civil war, a bit premature to save Mephibosheth. And here's a, here's a long one. It's, it feels like there were many events that had to take place in order for David to finally save uh, M. We'll call him just M because his Mephibosheth is long and convoluted. All these events made it so that David on the outside was a solid king and his people were very grounded. Almost like God kept throwing these tests and David would pass by, away, by always going back to God even after a victory. Okay, so now we are sort of grazing and we're also ruminating, right? We have, we have all these observations and that's similar to grazing, we're bringing it all in and we're questioning like, why, why didn't David save uh, Mephibosheth M <laughs> sooner? And uh, there are two more comments here. It feels like uh, it feels like it really was once he had established himself as king of all Israel and the surrounding area as well uh, was when he thought he could really find M by having enough resources and also influence over enough uh, over the land. Okay. Waited until he had reigned over all Israel to have the authority or opportunity, or he remembered his promise to Saul until then. Or he didn't simply know that there were any descendants alive of Jonathan. Oh, hey, yeah, I love this. <laughs> I, I yeah, never thought of that. Maybe, maybe David didn't know. And maybe David was busy. I mean, these are sort of great eight uh, answers, you know, like that I'm coming up with, like, you know, maybe he was really busy. And, uh, but your, all the things that you said is correct. Um, there was a civil war, uh, there's unrest, and uh, David didn't have all the authority or resources. And um, it was not until everything was settled 
that he was able to exercise his mercy and grace upon uh, M. But let's grace a little bit more. Let's rake in the information a little bit more and then bring in more observation into our rumination. What, what are some of the things that happened? What are some of the common things that took place in chapter one to eight? And if I, yeah, let, let me just give you some hints. Um, yeah, who got killed? Who got killed in, in from chapter one to eight? Okay. Saul and Jonathan got killed. And how did they get killed? Saul and most of his sons. Okay. Yeah, they they fell in the war and you know they probably had like Jonathan for sure, but what about Saul? How did he meet his like final final end? What was the uh mode of employment? Mercy killing. Oh, I like that. Yeah, he gave up. Like he's like I'm going to die. I got I got arrows coming out of my back like a porcupine. But ultimately he is killed. It's a mercy killing, but then the Amalekite or Ammonite who killed him, what does he do? He brings the goods, like the crown and everything and says, look, I killed him to King David. So uh, we have one comment here is where it says son, uh, Saul and most of his sons were killed. Who's the one that survives? Yeah. Abner is is uh, Saul's relative, maybe an uncle. Um, I, I should know this, but I'm so bad with these things. Yeah, so uh, Abner is uh, is Saul's line, you know, like family by blood, but he's not a direct descendant. But yeah, Ish Bosheth, I guess, or Bosheth. Oh yes, yeah, I, I should never say that. <laughs> anyway, um, let's call him Ish. Yeah, like a rash. Ish. Uh, what happens to Ish? All of the descendants seems to be seems to have died. Yeah, except for Jonathan's son. Yeah, Ish is killed. He was assassinated. And if you look at uh, Saul, all, like ultimately he was assassinated. Ish was assassinated. What happened to Abner? He was assassinated by David's right hand man. He was also assassinated. So let's put on our rumination thinking cap. What would have happened if David said in chapter two or three, Hey, let's go. Let's see who's who's still alive from Jonathan's house, and help him out, or help them out. What is he risking? They may have been killed. Yeah, they may have been assassinated, because people are thinking, David, um, you're only king of Judah. And if you have uh, real royal blood, then you're going to, you know, your throne is in threat. How many of you watched the movie, uh, a K-drama called, uh, King, called Kingdom? It's about Korean zombies and chosen dynasty. Yeah. So what happens in season, season one? <laughs> clap, clap, clap. What happens at the very last of season one, the very last episode? What the what is the greatest decision that uh, you know the the prince has to make? Oh yeah yeah. If you don't know the ending, never mind. We'll, we won't talk about. It. We won't ruin it for you. Okay, but it, yeah, season two's out, but season one. Uh, but it, it's sort of like that. Like you know, you it, it's if you have a surviving um, royal blood, then that's going to be a threat. So you you have to put them away. So, but David knows that. So we, 
how does this now, let's ruminate even further, and we're, we're going to bring this story into our life. And that's the most important part. That's the, that's the most important part of rumination, that you bring this story into yourself. And the question is, why doesn't God help me when I am in a bind? Why doesn't God help? Why doesn't God speak to me? Why doesn't God come to my rescue when I am when I am broken and I'm just a dead dog and I, I'm in a horrible situation? Yeah, many possible reasons, absolutely. But if you, since you and I are meditating on this narrative, this narrative will give us some answers, I think. Yeah, so the question, the original question is, why doesn't God help? Why does why is God so hidden? Why doesn't why does God delay his help? A uh, delay in helping me out of my bind. Just like uh, Mephibosheth, why didn't God, why didn't David help him in chapter two? Why at chapter nine? Why is there a delay? And we're looking at that text and we're imagining and we're applying that text to ourselves. Why doesn't God help me when I am in a, in, a, in a bind? Because God has his timing. And only when we look back, we see the really awesome, perfect way it was meant to be, a uh, uh, way it was, and it was meant to be delayed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's an aspect of timing. But what 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 part of, like, it, it, you know, what, what kind of... Uh, what is the reason for delay in this text that allows us to hope in God, although uh, his help for us personally is delayed? Like I feel super depressed, I feel super stressed, and or I'm in a financial uh, crisis. Why doesn't God just help me out like right here, right now? Sometimes it's a blessing in disguise, just like M's handicap which eventually saves him, okay? The delay was really for Mr. Map, because if not, Map could have been killed. Uh, yeah. And that's what we're trying to bring in. Maybe the delay helps, him, helps to form our heart to receive God's grace. Yes, um, I, for sure. And, and that has been my uh, testimony as well. And in this case, um, if you want to kind of meditate it from that angle, um, I think Mephibosheth running for all those years and living that out and to receive it at this point, receive David's mercy at this point is so much sweeter. It's like drinking, you know, like sometimes uh, people say drink two liters of water a day and just keep drinking. You don't, you're not even thirsty, you're drinking, you know, and you're just peeing that out. But imagine you are on a eight hour hike and you didn't get a single drop of water and it was a scorching hot that day. And you come to a well and drink that, you know, bucket of water and you know what that water does for you and you appreciate what that is. So it does humble us. I see that right there. Um, and, and we do seek God more fervently, for sure. Or maybe, okay, we have more comments here. Um, to me, God is telling me to stop, breathe, think, reassess the situation. Why, where, how, etc. 
God tends to show his a humor slash love when he starts giving us answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I'm going to wrap this up, but feel free to comment as we go. Uh, and and I'll, I'll read that off. But um, the word of God becomes sweeter when we step back and see it in a larger chunks. And Bible these days are just incredibly useful because they give you headings. And if you read different versions of the Bible, uh, go to BibleGate.com or whatever. Yeah, BibleGateway.com. And a parallel Bible is open. You can have like three, four, five different versions open. They have different headings because they have different way of interpreting and seeing the text. And as you step back and grace through that just quickly, um, so you want to read in detail and, and you want to step back and just graze and all of a sudden, like, you know, in a big macro form, you will be able to have your answers, uh, your questions answered in a, in a deeper way. So when I read chapter nine, the question is, why didn't David, who loved Jonathan more than his life, why didn't David help Mephibosheth? when he became king of Judah. He certainly had the resources. He certainly had the power. He certainly had the room and the means to help him. But why didn't he? And that answer comes from reading the entire thing. And that's how you graze. I know this, um, uh, this is sort of a more technical thing, technical side. But I encourage you, when, when you get a question, don't just sit there and make up an answer, but go through, step back and read through the whole thing and, and find your answers that way, rather than focusing on a few chapters or that chapter alone, or just making it up for yourself. Although that can be a very meaningful way to uh, ruminate, and I encourage that as well, but by stepping back and looking at the big picture, allows you to come as something very fresh and, and, and get, have a better understanding of what the author is trying to say or what the history is suggesting. Okay, so we have a few more comments. To me, God is telling me, this, oh no, sometimes God likes to take our biggest weakness and flip it around and use, uh, use it as the thing that brings you closer to him and shows himself through it. Yes, the theology of weakness and that we're surrendering our weakness to him. I wonder if David struggled whether or not he should help M. It's, uh, it's a risk to leave a descendant, as you said. Uh, it's not a clean slate. Yeah, we can certainly think about that. Um, and um, we were trying to find answers in the text. Yeah, of, of, and um, you may find it, you may not. But the fact that David was incredibly generous in chapter 9, and you can read through that, and that might give you some answers. And um, Yeah. So, 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 what, what time is it? Okay, 7.42. We're going to end at 7.45. Um, grazing is great, getting all this information and observation in, but ruminating, and if you have any questions about the text, you, you can ruminate upon it, think upon it, go back, regraze and, and ruminate again. But ultimately at the end, you want to ruminate to a point where it becomes your story. So we have the answer now that David did not help Mephibosheth until he knew that it's going to be a blessing. It's going to be that Mephibosheth is coming into a place where he's completely protected. So we can easily imagine and ruminate once again. If God is delaying and if God is hidden in my life, it's not because he doesn't love me. It's not because my legs are too crooked. And it's not because I'm not lovable and not, I'm not good enough. And he is just waiting for me. And he's just helping someone else who's better than me. But it is because he is waiting to prepare a perfect ending for me. That it will come in a way that I will understand and I will receive it in the best way possible. 
And that has been, um, I'm sure it has been your own experience as well. Hiddenness of God is not just because God doesn't love you or care or just some mysterious thing. No, he's working behind the scenes all the time. This text allows us to think and imagine that God is always at work. God is always at work to bring redemption and restoration in our life. Yay, and we finished one minute early. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, so on Wednesday, we'll be meet again. Um, I think what I will do is we will do a little bit more rumination style of life evil. So, and we will try to learn again to bring in the story into our life and learn to meditate on a story rather than just graze and just poop it out because <laughs> you're not getting anything out of that experience. Gross, but I think you'll remember that illustration forever and ever. Okay, let's pray. Father, we, um, we can really trust you when we ruminate upon a narrative like this. I mean, I can I guess we can say that about like just about every story in the Bible. But uh, we're we're learning that grazing alone doesn't cut it. It doesn't give us what we need. But we need to find a quiet spot uh, under under a, under the shade of a tree in a quiet place and bring back up to our mind and soul, what we have read, and we meditate upon those things. Today was a bit more technical or academic, I guess, God, but nonetheless, it's in the scripture, and, and we should challenge ourselves to do that. And Wednesday, we're going to be a little bit more imaginative, and it won't be as kind of whole sweeping um, thing, but God, either way, help us to uh, have all these tools and, and ways to develop our taste for all these riches that is buried in your scripture. Help us to taste it, live it, trans and be transformed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Thanks, guys. It was great seeing you. See you guys on Wednesday. Thank you. Amen, brothers and sisters. Uh, bye, Linda. <laughs> I was scrolling so fast. It was so funny. Bye, Daryl. Bye, Jackie. Bye, Susan. Bye, you. Oh, bye, Julia and that dog. <laughs> dog. Bye, Eugene. See you later. Bye. Good having you. Bye, Suge. <laughs>